From a and &E, this is Biography. From a and &E Studios in New York, with Peter Graves. The plays of William Shakespeare are universally acknowledged as timeless classics, but his life is shrouded in mystery. No playwright has ever found a wider audience, for all the world is indeed a stage for William Shakespeare. The bard, as he's called, is larger than life. He wrote plays of such magnitude, passion, and comedy and drama that they continue today to enthrall audiences all over the world. Actors revere him and sing his praises. Audiences delight in his wonderful use of the English language. Shakespeare explored all a man's vanities, flaws, passions, desires. He brought tragic heroes and overbearing buffoons to life. So now, biography takes a look at the life of William Shakespeare. Blow winds and crack your cheeks. Rage! Blow, you cataracts and hurricanoes. Spout till you have drenched our steeples. Drown William top. Shakespeare, the greatest playwright the English language has ever known. His plays, his poetry, his every word have become the very essence of our culture. Shakespeare lives on today through the words of his plays. 400 years on, his genius has never been surpassed. His drama takes the English language and runs with it. Life's but a walking shadow, a poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage and then is heard no more. Shakespeare's writing shows an extraordinary level of insight into the human experience, our innermost thoughts. Yet his own life remains an enigma, shrouded in the mysteries and complexities of Elizabethan England. William Shakespeare lived at a time of expansion, conquest, exploration, and discovery. England was a rising international power. Queen Elizabeth I reigned with a firm hand and a clear vision, bringing England to the edge of glory. It was a time of new pride in the nation, and for perhaps the first time, a pride in the English language. England was ripe for the arrival of the genius of Shakespeare. Shakespeare was born in the spring of 1564. He was baptized in Holy Trinity Church in the market town of Stratford-upon-Avon on the 26th of April. The register records his name with the Latin Gulielmus, Filius Johannes Shakespeare. Elizabethan baptisms took place three days after birth, so Shakespeare was born on St. George's Day. The year he was born, Stratford was struck by a terrible outbreak of plague. People died in their thousands, cruel and painful deaths. The names of the dead are listed in these 16th century records. The vicar has written in the margin, Hic incipit pestis, here begins the plague. And you can see as we turn the pages, the entries get more and more frequent throughout July, August, September, a terrible month. Um, by the end of the year, the outbreak had passed away. So perhaps it's a miracle in a sense that Shakespeare even sort of lived to write the place he did. William was the third child and first son of John and Mary Shakespeare. His two elder sisters had died in infancy. Well, Shakespeare was the child of a quite well-to-do family, particularly at the age in which he will have first gone to school. His father had come to Stratford from Snitterfield, from a little village close by. Uh, he'd been uh, in a quite a substantial farming family before he came here. And when he got to Stratford, he obviously made good. John Shakespeare was a glover and leather worker. A shrewd man, he improved his living by money lending and wool dealing, making his way up the social ladder, eventually becoming High Bailiff of Stratford. William's mother, Mary, was a lively and intelligent woman brought up on a farm at Wilmcote. She was an important influence on the boy. As a child, Shakespeare led a very disciplined life. In the summers, you got up between three and four in a rural community. 
in the winters at five o'clock. Shakespeare would get up. Um, he would clean his teeth with a soft cloth and a sweet paste. He would go downstairs and hope to get his father's blessing, a sign of approval. He might go off to help his father at the Thursday market. Otherwise, he would go to school for um, quite a number of hours during the day. John Shakespeare's position in the town meant that William was allowed to go to the local school. The Elizabethans took education seriously, and the school day was long and demanding. Here, Shakespeare translated texts from English to Latin and Latin to English. At that school, he would have read some of the great classics, the great Latin classics like Ovid, for example. He would have read Ovid's Metamorphoses, which clearly became one of his favorite books. He would have been expected, actually, to speak Latin from the age of about eight, and he would have been thwacked if he didn't speak in Latin. This was a requirement of the school. I suppose for us, Ovid sounds like a classical author, a rather dreary uh, matter, people think of classical authors. In fact, Ovid is a very exciting author uh, who will have uh, filled Shakespeare's mind with images of violence on the one hand and romance on the other. Shakespeare's interest in the lives of the great Romans was reflected later in his life, in the plays Julius Caesar, Antony and Cleopatra, and Coriolanus. Shakespeare's first taste of the theatre was undoubtedly watching the travelling players who came to Stratford every year, performing their plays and songs in any available hall, tavern or market. When Shakespeare was a child, there was a great festival at nearby Kenilworth Castle. It belonged to Robert Dudley, the Earl of Leicester, a suitor of the Virgin Queen, Elizabeth. Dudley arranged the festival in the hope of charming her with its amazing sights, its plays, music, singing and dancing. As an 11-year-old boy at the time of the entertainment, which was famous throughout the county, notorious, which people were flocking to, I don't doubt that uh, Shakespeare's father took him over to Kenilworth, that he saw these uh, events, was aware of their immense appeal. These childhood memories perhaps inspired him when he wrote his plays. There is an episode in A Midsummer Night's Dream where Oberon seems to describe the sights of this splendid festival at the castle. We know Shakespeare did not go to a university. His family were badly off as his father's business dealings had gone from bad to worse. But little else is known about his life at this time. These early years have become known as the lost years. I think the most plausible explanation is that at the end of his school days, he was withdrawn from school at the age of 14 or 15 and became an apprentice to his father in his father's glover's business in Stratford. Only a mile away in the village of Shottery lived the woman who was to become Shakespeare's wife, Anne Hathaway. Anne was eight years older than Shakespeare and fell pregnant with his child when he was only 18. They hurriedly obtained a special license to marry, dated November 28, 1582, six months before the child was born. The church court, the ecclesiastical court, could have asked Shakespeare and his wife to apologize for their sexual activity before marriage uh, by standing up in church in a white sheet and uh, making a statement to the whole congregation. This would have been uh, uh, difficult, really, not only for Shakespeare, but for his father. It would have been a slightly black mark against the family. Very little is known about his marriage to Anne Hathaway. We do know that 10 years later, Shakespeare was working in London. There are hundreds of conflicting stories about what he was doing throughout his 20s. Some people think he might have been a soldier because there are quite a lot of soldiers in the plays. Some people think he might have been a sailor because the plays include references to the sea. Some people think he may have traveled to Italy, for example, because there are a lot of Italian settings for his plays. There is a fairly early legend that he spent that time as a, sh as a schoolmaster in the country. 
We do know he had three children. His daughter Susanna had been born the summer after his wedding. And two years later, twins, Hamnet and Judith, were born. William Shakespeare had a growing family, but it seems these ties were not enough to keep him. It's thought he began writing in Stratford, perhaps some sonnets, and during the 1580s, he left home and headed for London. And it was in the hustle and bustle of the new professional theatres that William Shakespeare was about to launch what was to be the most sensational playwriting career in the history of the English language. By 1592, William Shakespeare was in London, making his mark as an actor and writer. He had joined a group of actors in the new theatres and had turned to writing his first plays, Two Gentlemen of Verona and Henry VI. He was a great success, and the literary establishment took against him this startlingly talented young man. Robert Greene, who was dying of alcohol and a lot of other things in 1592, he... Um, uh, produced a very bitter last uh, pamphlet called His Groat's Worth of Wit Bought with a Million of Repentance, um, in which he attacked Shakespeare and a couple of other playwrights for being, in effect, parvenus. There is an upstart crow, beautified with our feathers, that with his tiger's heart wrapped in a player's hide, supposes he is as well able to bombast out a blank verse as the best of you and being an absolute Johannes factotum, is, in his own conceit, the only shake scene in the country. Green attacked Shakespeare for being very tight with money, uh, for being a waspish little worm, for being ungrateful, egotistical, mean-minded. He actually paraphrased a line from Henry VI, part three, uh, about a tiger's heart wrapped in a woman's hide, in which he talked about a tiger's heart wrapped in a player's hide. Green's outburst is the first evidence we have of Shakespeare as a playwright. It proves that by 1592, Shakespeare had already written the third part of Henry VI and was established as a playwright. His career was going from strength to strength. He was obviously a great success. One of Shakespeare's first plays, one that we, we hardly ever take any notice of these days, Henry VI, Part I, produced tears from 10,000 spectators in the theatre with the uh, success of his play. That was the first sort of public credo, the public advert of how effective Shakespeare's plays were. Shakespeare's talent lay in his ability to write a vast range of material. Throughout the 1590s, he wrote poems, sonnets, and plays, the early comedies and the history plays. He almost seems to set out to show that he can write a clever comedy, the, the Comedy of Errors, based on a Roman play, for example, a lyrical comedy, The Two Gentlemen of Verona, based on an Italian novel, uh, a deeply serious, gory tragedy, Titus Andronicus, uh, full of references to the early history of Rome, a very uh, uh, profoundly ambitious work for a, a young man. And there are the English history plays, the plays about Henry VI, followed by Richard III, culminating in Richard III. Now is the winter of our discontent made glorious summer by this son of York. And all the clouds that lowered upon our house in the deep bosom of the ocean buried. Shakespeare's success in the theatre drew him to the attention of a number of great noblemen. Most importantly, he was drawn into the circle of the Earl of Southampton. In 1593 and 1594, he dedicated two poems, Venus and Adonis and The Rape of Lucrece, to the Earl of Southampton. The love I dedicate to your lordship is without end, whereof this pamphlet, without beginning, is but a superfluous moiety. Some of the most well-known and most beautiful love poetry in the English language is found in Shakespeare's sonnets. Much of it written by the poet to a young man, perhaps the Earl of Southampton. Southampton was his patron, and some scholars say they were lovers. 
Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art more lovely and more temperate. Rough winds do shake the darling buds of May, and summer's lease hath all too short a date. The Earl of Southampton undoubtedly would, was uh, what we would call today bisexual, if not uh, homosexual, in his early youth. He had plenty of lovely young men around, and Shakespeare undoubtedly was dazzled by the exterior of this beautiful young man. Sonnets are elaborate exercises in the technical skills of writing poetry. They are artifice, but of all Shakespeare's work, we can perhaps come closest to the man in the sonnets. There's a sort of story behind the sonnets, the story of uh, the poet's affection for, it might not be too much to say, infatuation with a young man, a man younger than himself. Deep affection could even be a love affair between the two men. Um, there is a rival poet, there's the suggestion that another poet uh, is a rival for the affections of the, of the young man. And then in the last group of sonnets, as they were eventually printed, there is a woman who is always known as the Dark Lady. My mistress's eyes are nothing like the sun. Coral is far more red than her lips red. The sonnets to and about the Dark Lady portray an obsessive love, uh, a love which the poet despises himself at times for feeling, an entanglement, an emotional entanglement that he'd really rather, in many ways, be out of, a sort of state of intense, intimate, emotional unhappiness. I have seen roses damasked red and white, but no such roses see I in her cheeks. And in some perfumes is there more delight than in the breath that from my mistress reeks. The beautiful young man and the dark woman are both uh, resented. They're both considered treacherous and duplicitous. She is a bay where all men ride, ugly and dreadful, and I only regret, as it were, says the sonnet speaker, uh, that I'm attached to her. We, I can't break off my relationship. Now, the young man is supposed to be very beautiful and very consoling, but he too proves to be fickle. So Shakespeare is raging uh, through the speaker at uh, people whom he apparently likes, and that's rather disturbing. But it was the theater that called him back again and again, demanding more and better scripts each time. His plays were popular, successful, and above all, commercial. Shakespeare had to be better than the best of them. The theater was very greedy for scripts at that date. We have evidence of uh, theater proprietors actually knocking on the doors of playwrights saying, is the script finished yet? And uh, clearly Shakespeare will have been sensitive to that kind of uh, pressure. And uh, the 37 plays that he produced in the, well, was it 20 years that he was in London, is quite a lot of plays. While living in London, Shakespeare very much kept himself to himself. He worked hard, rehearsing in the mornings and performing in the afternoons. He had to write in the evenings, and that meant huge costs, not only in paper, which itself was a hugely expensive item, but also in candles and tapers and lanterns and things to, to be able to see to write by. I have a theory, actually, he spent most of his time in Elizabethan pubs, because there you got um, automatic light along with the meal that you ate in the evening. It would certainly have been cheaper for him to work in a pub than it would have been to work in his lodging. Shakespeare was living away from the family. They were growing up in Stratford-upon-Avon without him. He was writing new plays, Love's Labour's Lost, Romeo and Juliet, and A Midsummer Night's Dream. As an actor and a member of the acting company, he had to be on call every day of the week throughout the period of acting. And the only realistic time to ride up to Stratford, which would have taken two, three days from London anyway, would have been through the 40 days of Lent when acting was officially banned. Perhaps Shakespeare's marriage was indeed loveless. There are not many happy marriages in his plays. In Twelfth Night, his character Orsino gives this advice. Don't marry an older woman. 
Let still the woman take an elder than herself. So wears she to him. So sways she level in her husband's heart. Let thy love be younger than thyself, or thy affection cannot hold the bent. For women are as roses, whose fair flower being once displayed doth fall that very hour. Throughout the 1590s, London was threatened by several serious outbreaks of the plague. At its height, it was killing a thousand people a week. If you showed the symptoms, you stood a 70% chance of dying. Those who could fled the city, and the theatres were closed. Shakespeare's new playwriting career was repeatedly halted by these devastating outbreaks of plague. The Queen's government and the city together uh, could decide to close down the theatres for any length of time because of a plague alert. That is, if uh, the number of deaths in London from plague, plague was always more or less present, but if it reached a, a certain number, maybe 20 or 30 deaths a week, the, the theatres could be closed. Thomas Decker, a writer of the day, described this terrible disease that swept through London. A stiff and freezing horror sucks up the rivers of my blood. My hair stands on end with the panting of my brains. Mine eyeballs are ready to start out, being beaten with the billows of my tears. Out of my weeping pen does the ink mournfully and more bitterly than gall drop on the pale-faced paper, even when I do but think how the bowels of my sick country have been torn out. A fascination with death resonates throughout Shakespeare's plays. The tombs of Romeo and Juliet, the bones of the charnel house, the graveyard in Hamlet. Shakespeare's darkest fears were about to be realized. In the summer of 1596, back home in Stratford, Shakespeare's family were stricken with grief. That August, a disaster struck, and the, the cruelest thing happened to Shakespeare imaginable, the very worst thing, uh, the most terrible event of his married life. This register records the burial of Hamnet, Shakespeare's only son. Hamnet Phileus William Shakespeare. Hamnet, son of William Shakespeare, 11th August, 1596, aged 11. What this meant uh, was that there would be no male Shakespeare to inherit Shakespeare's wealth. The family would die out. Whatever Shakespeare did, no matter how much money he, uh, he uh, earned, how much land he acquired, it would all be dissipated. Grief fills the room up of my absent child. Lies in his bed, walks up and down with me, puts on his pretty looks, repeats his words, remembers me of all his gracious parts, stuffs out his vacant garments with his form. Towards the end of the 1590s, Shakespeare began to write plays of a greater depth that seemed to reflect the experiences of his life. The death of his son, Hamnet, is interesting when you think he wrote a great, great play called Hamlet. And, and he loved Hamlet, passionately, clearly did. It comes through every line, was fascinated. To be or not to be, that is the question. Whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune or to take arms against a sea of troubles and by opposing end them. Shakespeare's troubles were not yet over. The actors could not renew the lease on the land where their London theatre stood. The city fathers had objected to this popular new form of entertainment. They saw theatres as ungodly and immoral. 
Undaunted, Shakespeare's troupe tore down the old theater and transported it plank by plank south across the River Thames and built a new theater amongst the bear-baiting gambling houses and brothels of Southwark. This was to be the new Globe Theatre. It was one of the most splendid theatres of the day and was part owned by William Shakespeare. His 10% share was valuable and made him his fortune. The theatre company won great acclaim. The first play performed at the Globe was Shakespeare's Julius Caesar. He was writing for a theatre without scenery, with very simple costumes under open light and so he had to use the one tool he had which was language which is, which is his words to create the world so th there are a lot of there's a lot of visual imagery in his language there's a lot of character detail in the language there are a lot of stage directions in the language the audience had to be persuaded in language into imagining themselves into the situation they're in. You've got that at the very beginning of Hamlet, for instance, where you're told in the first six lines of the play that it's past midnight and it's bitter cold. And that was something people were told middle of the afternoon in broad daylight. Shakespeare's audiences relied on their imaginations during every performance. The simple stage reverberated only with Shakespeare's words. All the women's parts were played by men. The, the great heroic women were played by adult men, by very experienced adult male actors. The sort of girls' parts, and that includes a part like Juliet in Romeo and Juliet, would be played by a boy whose voice had not yet broken. There isn't a great deal of evidence about what part Shakespeare played, and whatever they were, they were pretty certainly not major ones. There is a sonnet that praises him playing kingly parts, which is understandable, and one of the kingly parts that he almost certainly did play was the ghost of Hamlet's father, a nice role, the ghost that instigates the whole story. I am thy father's spirit, doomed for a certain term to walk the night and for the day confined to fast in fires till the foul crimes done in my days of nature are burnt and purged away. And it was his experience as an actor that added so much to his skill as a playwright. He brings an actor's sensibility and he brings an actor's um, common sense. He brings an actor's skill to the delineation of of character. Interestingly, he called himself a poet, of course. That's how he described himself. Not a playwright, not an actor, a poet. Um, and we should probably never forget that, that actually there is something in the distillation of language, the condensation of experience into words that the poet can do unlike anybody else. Shakespeare's words, written at this time of great linguistic invention, transformed the English language forever. The subjects of his plays, however, were taken from many different sources, even from existing plays. Like most Elizabethans, Shakespeare derived most of his stories. On the whole, he didn't invent them. Bernard Shaw praised Shakespeare's genius for telling a story, provided somebody else had told it to him first. That was a characteristic bit of Shavian wit, but there's a lot of truth in that. Almost all of Shakespeare's plays are based either on history or on ready written fictions. Richard III was a popular villain and Henry V was a popular hero. So that uh, one more play about both of them would go down very well, particularly with this uh, freshness that Shakespeare's adding to it. Uh, another version of Hamlet uh, will be delightful. But by the 1600s, something was beginning to happen to his work. Shakespeare was becoming a better and better observer of life and was writing more profound and more disturbing plays. He'd written the extraordinary tragedy of Hamlet, and his powers as a dramatist were now so developed that he was about to create some of the greatest dramas that have ever been written.
In 1603, King James I was crowned King of England. Shakespeare's players became the King's Men, actors to the court and the king. Shakespeare was the leading dramatist of the time. His family had been granted a coat of arms several years before, and he was now a gentleman. These last years were perhaps the greatest of his playwriting career. Between 1604 and 1607, Shakespeare wrote the tragedies Othello, Macbeth, and King Lear. Shakespeare's tragedies are somewhere close to the very center of his work, and so they must have been close to the center of his imagination. Clearly, the, the violence of the plays, the, the tension, the sense of personalities that one gets in the tragedies must have had a distinct appeal for Shakespeare. There must have been something within Shakespeare that was urging him on to write in this way, that it's part of an interior journey, a development of the soul, if you like, to use a rather old-fashioned phrase. The deep interest in human psychology, which is evidenced, for example, in Othello, with the uh, very vivid and intensely felt portrayal of Othello's jealousy, or the, the tragedy of Leo with uh, the tragedy of an old man reluctant to give up power. You see me here, you gods, a poor old man, as full of grief as age, wretched in both, if it be you who turn these daughters' hearts. Against the father, fool me not so much to bear it tamely. Touch me with noble anger, and let not women's weapons water drop stain my man's cheeks. No! You unnatural hags! I'll have such revenges on you both that all the world shall... You don't write a play of the depth, of the profundity and significance of King Lear just because somebody says it's time you wrote a serious tragedy, old man. You write it because you've been meditating for rather a long time, rather deeply, on the issues that a play like that uh, raises to the surface. He shows us people of sustained rage, very unusually. King Lear would be an obvious example. But what about gentle Prince Hamlet? Hamlet rages through the whole play. So the writer of these plays was a man who understood anger very well. The tragedies give us a tantalizing glimpse into Shakespeare's character, his innermost thoughts and deepest emotions. He's writing scenes uh, which reflect human situations. Uh, take Hamlet, for example, the mourning for Ophelia, Hamlet's mourning over Ophelia. The plays are full of things which go on speaking to people as long as human beings are human beings and have sufferings and uh, longings. In middle age, Shakespeare became more and more concerned with his relationship with his daughters. Time and time again throughout his later plays, he presents us with a father who is preoccupied with his daughters in Pericles, Cymbeline, The Winter's Tale, and The Tempest. One may turn to perhaps the greatest tragedy ever written and uh, the most, most affecting, moving, terrible work of the Jacobean era, which is King Lear. The whole tragedy begins, doesn't it, with uh, difficulties with the daughter. And here we have this tremendously moving ending when Lear finally recognizes Cordelia's worth. No, I know not where I did lodge last night. <laughs> Do not laugh at me, but as I am a man, I think this lady to be my child.
Perhaps in the last play he wrote alone, The Tempest, we can see the clearest picture of Shakespeare in his final years in the character of Prospero. Prospero puts on a mask, an entertainment, in the course of the play, and you can draw a parallel between Prospero as the creator of that mask and Shakespeare as the creator of dramatic entertainments. But above all, uh, Prospero is a character who has magical power, but he's also somebody who gives up his magic at the end of the play. He says he'll burn his books, and he returns to being an ordinary person again. Our revels now are ended. These, our actors, as I foretold you, were all spirits and are melted into air, into thin air. And like the baseless fabric of this vision, the cloud-capped towers, the gorgeous palaces, the solemn temples, the great globe itself, yea, all which it inherit, shall dissolve. And like this insubstantial pageant faded, leave not a rack behind. We are such stuff as dreams are made on, and our little life is rounded with a sleep. In the summer of 1613, the globe was destroyed. It burned to the ground during a performance of Henry VIII, leaving nothing behind. A new Globe Theatre was built, but without William Shakespeare. The fire marked the end of his career, and he retired to Stratford. William Shakespeare retired a wealthy man. He was a gentleman, a businessman, and a landowner. He owned the second largest house in Stratford and was a respected figure in the town. The desperate struggles of his days as an actor in the red light districts of London were forgotten. But still, he had no son, no male heir to inherit his fortune. His will is an angry document. It's in two parts showing a tremendous amount of worry over what, what is to happen after his death. Shakespeare had made out one version of his will, apparently, early in 1616. He made out a very different version later, not long before he died, empowering Susanna, his older daughter, and Susanna's husband, John Hall, who was a physician, and really leaving no power to either Judith or to uh, Shakespeare's own wife. This bitter rift in his family life is perhaps shown by the bequest to his wife Anne of the second best bed in their Stratford home. It seems curiously offhand. Uh, it seems uh, somehow to a man so sensitive to the use of words, a man whose occupation uh, was in using words, to use the phrase without, ex without excuse, and without apology, my leave to my wife, my second best bed, seems somehow to suggest that maybe the pair, although reasonably well matched in terms of social status and so on, may not have been emotionally very close over the period of their marriage. One night after a drinking session with his old theater friends, the story is written down that Shakespeare ate too many pickled herrings and drank too much wine. He caught a fever and fell sick. He died on his birthday and was buried on the 25th of April, 1616, aged 52. Perhaps some of the last words he wrote were his own epitaph. Good friend, for Jesus' sake forbear to dig the dust enclosed here. Blessed be the man that spares these stones, and cursed be he that moves my bones. William Shakespeare died without seeing his plays officially published. Odd quartos had appeared during his lifetime, some scribbled down hurriedly and inaccurately during performances. His plays were brought together for the first time in 1623, seven years after his death carefully gathered by his fellow actors and friends. Ben Johnson, a man who had been his severest critic, greatest rival, and good friend, was instrumental in putting together the folio. It was filled with verses written as tributes to Shakespeare. 
it is perhaps the greatest gift ever bestowed on the English language. Johnson describes him as gentle Shakespeare and sweet swan of Avon. These verses in the folio pay tribute to Shakespeare, and the greatest of them is the poem by Ben Jonson uh, in praise of Shakespeare, in, in, in which he has the famous phrase, he, he was not of an age, but for all time. It's an eloquent uh, tribute from one artist to another. To the memory of my beloved, the author, Master William Shakespeare, and what he hath left us. While I confess thy writings to be such, as neither man nor muse can praise too much. Soul of the age, the applause, delight, the wonder of our stage. Thou art a monument without a tomb, and art alive still while thy book doth live, and we have wits to read and praise to give. Without these efforts, we might never have known William Shakespeare's plays. 18 out of the 36 plays gathered in the folio had never been published. These plays, including Macbeth, Twelfth Night, and The Tempest, might have been lost forever. In 1899, the first film version of a Shakespeare play was made starring Herbert Beerbohm Tree as King John. Since then, countless movies and television films of his plays have been made and shown throughout the world. In every continent, his plays are performed in the best theaters to packed houses. For an actor, the highest accolade is to perform the great Shakespearean heroes. Richard Burton, Elizabeth Taylor, Laurence Olivier, Orson Welles, Sir John Gielgud, Kenneth Branagh. The very greatest of them have all played Shakespeare. After whatever it is, 400 years, Shakespeare still has the power to transform people's lives. I've sat in performances in Stratford-upon-Avon. I've watched hundreds and hundreds of shows, of our shows, from the back of the stalls. And you can sometimes witness something happening in the theatre which is very profound. And clearly, the stories, the words of Shakespeare, affect people in a way that no other playwright can do. Written for the simplicity of the Elizabethan stage, Shakespeare's plays have taken on a life and influence way beyond their original intention. The constant renewal of Shakespeare, the way in which new ways of staging him are always being invented, is actually one of the reasons why we have to say he is the greatest playwright. His plays are more fertile. They actually generate more exciting ways of doing it and exciting things, and indeed exciting ideas, um, than any other play. And this is, this is the ultimate testimony. Some are born great. Huh? Some achieve greatness. What's there, sir? And some have greatness thrust upon them. Come and restore thee. <laughs> Remember who commended thy yellow stockings? And wish to see thee ever cross guarded. Cross guarded? Oh, go to. Thou art made if thou desirest to be so. Am I made? If not, let me see thee a servant still. Why, this is very midsummer madness. Shakespeare is a supreme manipulator of language. His themes interweave the major and minor, the universal and the particular. He writes about love, death, happiness, sorrow, jealousy, hate, crossing all international boundaries. He is a poet, but more than that, he is a storyteller, a raconteur, a dramatist. Shakespeare is inescapable. He's in the air around us, even though we may not be conscious of. He's in the water supply, as it were. To die. To sleep. To sleep, perchance to dream. Aye, there's the rub. For in that sleep of death, what dreams may come when we have shuffled off this mortal coil must give us pause. William Shakespeare remains the very greatest, enduring for all time. His writing is his legacy to the world. <laughs>